go. Interesting, interesting. Oh, try to approve it. Good question. Boop, boop, boop. Edit. Hmm. Okay, it's already there. Public. It's for kids. Um, made for kids. Yeah, video set to made for kids. Made for kids. Uh, uh, uh. Mm -mm -mm. Weird. Um, let's see, can I, oh, wait, what if, I see, I see. What if I, I see. So Vian, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to watch my own live stream. And maybe if I, can I do that? I wonder if that'll work. Because if so, that would that would really help. Not approved. Here we go. Approve. Okay, that is so weird. Here we go. Approve. Okay, that is. So okay, so uh, so um, try. All right. So what I did was I went, so I clicked, even though I'm doing this live stream, I opened the live stream on another tab, approved it on the other tab. Hopefully that allows, oh, we're up to five already, seven. Woo! That's really strange. That's really, really strange to me. Huh. Um, all right, so seven, eight. Oh, good. People are people are filing in. That's good. So I'm gonna we're gonna do something different today for reading. I uh, so yesterday's yesterday's live stream, the one that was not successful at all. It had um, I talked about uh, these artifacts here, this artifact, this drawing, and um, I wanted to show you. Uh, the read aloud. I'm going to play the read aloud for Island of the Blue Dolphins, and I, I'm going to draw uh, on this on my um, on my tablet here. So I'm going to draw on this, and you can listen along. You can you can also draw if you want. Um, but what I like to do, what I like to do for for read alouds is I like to you know sometimes take notes. I like to draw, obviously. Um, Let's see if that's see if people are having success. Oh, cool. Excellent, excellent. So Nam Gal, Jung Min got well, hopefully Jung Min got on. All right. Cool. All right, welcome everybody. So I'm going to, yeah, like I said, I'm gonna open up. So I'm gonna play this. I've already uploaded um, eight eight chapters. The first eight chapters are already loaded. So I'm gonna go back to chapter two because this book is really important and significant because this is the, I thought I had a book, book. I thought I had a, um, one of my posters here. Oh, here we go. So the reason, the reason this book is so important now is the Island of the Blue Dolphin starts off with some European, um, they're not Spanish. I believe they're Russian. Um, I have to double check. So the people who lived on, the native people who lived on the island of the Blue Dolphins, uh, they, there's some visitors come who want to hunt a particular animal. And the visitors that come and want to hunt that animal, uh, they, they bring some, uh, they bring a, a, a trunk, like a chest full of, uh, jewelry and uh, necklaces, bracelets. Um, none of this is a spoiler, by the way. Uh, but I thought this is a good, this is a really good place in our 
I'm finding the one. Oh, here we go. So now we're up to about 10. I'll see if anybody else can join us before I start drawing here. Cool. All right. So I think we're good. 11 people. And some more will join us. So my, uh, my plan again, I already, uh, I already did one sketch. It's very, it's a very simple sketch. It's not, not fancy at all. Um, this is a, that's not my sketch. This is my sketch. Come on now. Whoop. So my, <laughs> my sketch here is about, is about her brother. That's her brother. Um, her brother at one point has a spear and he's holding a spear above his, above his head. And well, you'll, you'll get to that chapter in a little bit. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to erase this or maybe I'll just move it up. There we go. Uh, all right. So let's do a new sketch. Let's do it horizontal though. Okay. There we go. All right. So I will start sketching. I'm going to play the, I'm going to play the read aloud. Hopefully you can hear that the read aloud well. I have my microphone here. So get comfy. Uh, feel free to draw also. And uh, yeah, here we go. This is chapter two, by the way. Chapter two. Captain Orlov and his elude hunters moved to the island that morning, making many trips from their ship to the beach of, the, of Coral Cove. Since the beach was small and almost flooded when the tide was in, he asked if he could camp on higher ground. This, my father agreed to. Perhaps I should tell you about our village, our island, so you will know how it looks and where our village was and where the Aleuts camped for most of the summer. Our island is two leagues long and one league wide, and if you're standing on one of the hills that rise in the middle of it, you would think it, that it looked like a fish, like a dolphin lying on its side with its tail pointing toward the sunrise and its nose pointing to the sunset, and its fins making reefs and the rocky ledges along the shore. Whether someone did stand there on the low hills in the days when the earth was new and because of its shape called it the island of the blue dolphins, I do not know. Many dolphins live in our seas, and it may be from them that the name came. But one way or another, this is what the island was called. The first thing you would notice about our island, I think, is the wind. It blows almost every day, sometimes from the northwest and sometimes from the east, once in a long while out of the south. All the winds except the one from the south are strong, and because of them, the hills are polished smooth and the trees are small and twisted, even the canyon, in the canyon, that runs down to Coral Cove. The village of Gas Alat, or sorry, Galas At, lay east of the hills on a small mesa near Coral Cove and a good spring. About half, about a half league to the north is another spring, and it was there that the Aleuts put up their tents, which were made of skins, and were so low to the earth that the men had to crawl into them on their stomachs. At dusk, we could see the glow of their fires. That night, my father warned everyone in the village of Galas Up against visiting the camp. The Aleuts come from a country far to the north, he said. Their ways are not ours, nor is their language. They have come to take otter and to give us our share in many good which they have and which we could use. In this way shall we profit, but we shall not profit if we try to befriend them. They are people who do not understand friendship. They are not those who were here before, but are people of the same tribe that caused trouble many years ago. My father's words were obeyed. We did not go to the Aleut camp, and they did not come to our village. But this is not to say that we did not know what they did, what they ate, and in what way they cooked it, how many otter were killed each day, and other things as well. For someone was always watching from the cliffs while they were hunting, or from the ravine when they were in the camp. Ramal, for instance, brought news about Captain Orla. In the morning, when he crawls out of his tent, he sits on a rock and combs until... The beard shines like cormorant's wing, Ramon said. My sister, Ulape, who was two years older than I, gathered the most curious news of all. She swore that there was an elude girl among the hunters. 
She's dressed in skins, just like the men, Ulape said. But she wears a fur cap, and under the cap, she has thick hair that falls to her waist. No one believed Ulape. Everyone laughed at the idea that hunters would bother to bring their wives with them. The Aleuts also watched our village. Otherwise, they would not have known about the good fortune which befell us soon after they came. It happened this way. Early spring is a poor season for fishing. The heavy seas and winds of winter drive the fish into deep water where they stay until the weather is settled and where they are hard to catch. During this time, the village eats sparingly, mostly from stores of seeds harvested in autumn. Words of our good fortune came on a stormy afternoon, brought by Ulape, who was never idle. She had gone to a ledge on the eastern part of the island, hoping to gather shellfish. She was climbing a cliff on the way home, and she heard a loud noise behind her. At first, she did not see what had caused the noise. She thought that it was the wind echoing through one of the caves and was about to leave when she noticed silvery shapes on the floor of the cove. The shapes moved and she saw that it was a school of large white bass, each one as big as she was. Pursued by killer whales, which prey upon them when seals are not to be found, the bass had tried to escape by swimming toward the shore, but in their terror they had mistaken the depth of the water and had been tossed onto the rocky ledge. Ulape dropped her basket of shellfish and set out for the village, arriving there so out of breath that she could only point in the direction of the shore. The women were cooking supper, but all of them stopped and gathered around here, waiting for her to speak. A school of white bass, she finally said. Where? Where? Everyone asked. On the rocks, a dozen of them, perhaps more than a dozen. Before Ulape had finished speaking, we were running toward the shore, hoping that we would get there in time, that the fish had not flopped back into the sea, or that a chance wave had not washed them away. We came to the cliff and looked down. The school of white bass was still on the ledge, glistening in the sun. But since the tide was high and the biggest waves were already lapping at the fish, there was no time to lose. One by one, we hauled them out of the reach of the tide. Then, two women carrying a single fish, for they were all of about the same size and heavy. We lifted them up the cliff and brought them home. There were enough for everyone in our tribe for supper that night and the next. But in the morning... Two Aleuts came to the village and asked to speak to my father. Do you have fish? One of them said. Enough only for my people, my father answered. You have 14 fish, the Aleuts said. Seven now, because we ate seven. From seven, you can spare two. There are 40 in your camp, my father replied, and more than that of us. Besides... You have your own fish, the dried ones that you brought. We're tired of that kind, the Aleut said. He was a short man who only came to my father's shoulders, and he had small eyes like black pebbles and a mouth like the edge of a stone knife. The other Aleut looked very much like him. You are hunters, my father said. Go and hunt your own fish if you are tired of what you are now eating. I have my people to think of. Captain Orlov will hear that you refuse to share the fish. Yes, tell him, my father said, but also why we refuse. The Aleut grunted to his companion, and the two of them stalked off on their short legs across the sand dunes that lay between the village and their camp. We ate the rest of the white bass that night, and there was much rejoicing. But little did we know, as we ate and sang and the older men told stories around the fire, that our good fortune would soon bring trouble to Galas Ott. So the good fortune they're talking about. So what I did was on the previous, on the pre, so I have like, it's like a sketchbook. So I'm gonna turn the lights on so you can see. So it's like a, um, this app is like a sketchbook. Can you still see? Yeah, I guess so. So there's different layers, um, and the layer beneath this, I, I had the, so these bass, these bass, so there's water. I don't know if you can see the ocean here very well, but what I did was I drew, um, 
I drew some, uh, oh, there it is. There we go. So there's the water here, all right. the water here, right? There's all this water and the way the bath and the bass were uh, washed up on the rocks. And that's great because on the islands, the, um, the, uh, the tribe, the people who lived on the island, um, they, it was hard to find, you know, fish. It's hard to catch fish. It's a lot of work. So they were really happy. Um, oh, it's really messy looking. So hide that. There we go. So here they, so, so the island, right? The island is pointed in a direction where the tail, the tail of the island is facing south. The head of the island is north. And there's uh, the Aleuts when they sail. They're somewhere on the island. But this is not a, this is not a tiny island. It's a really big island. Um, and this is part of the conflict that arrives. You know, the, the Aleuts want the fish and the father, who's the chief, uh, her father says uh, to them, your hunters go hunt the fish. And, you know, they, I don't know, they, you'll see. <laughs> so uh, how's that going? Oh, where did they, where did they come from? That's good. Um, they arrived the Aleuts are from, I'm pretty sure the Aleuts are from up north. I think they're from Alaska. That's where that tribe is. So the Aleuts are also native people, but the Aleuts are native people from Alaska. Uh, and the tribe that lives, the people that live on the um, island of the Blue Dolphins, they don't have a, a very friendly relationship. Uh, good. And then the reason, so the whole reason the soldiers are there, they're hunting, um, they're hunting animals. And anybody know what animals they're hunting? Because I think about six of you listened to the uh, chapter one. Anybody know where that came from? Chapter two, where's the next one? Chapter three, right? Uh, where's my playlist? Okay. Uh, do, do, do. Playlist. There we go, playlist. So let's do, uh, yeah, we got time. Let's do chapter three on the Blue Dolphins. View. And here we'll do chapter three. There we go. So otters, otters are what they're hunting. Here we go. Chapter three. The wide beds, beds of kelp, which surround our island on three sides, came close to the shore and spread out to sea for a distance of a league. In those, in these deep beds, even on days of heavy winds, the Aleuts hunted. They left the shore at dawn in their skin canoes and did not return until night, towing them, towing after them the slain otter. The sea otter, when it is swimming, looks like a seal, but is really very different. It has a shorter nose than a seal, small webbed feet instead of flippers, and fur that is thicker and much more beautiful. It is also different in other ways. The otter likes to lie on its back in the kelp beds, floating up and down to the motion of the waves, sunning itself or sleeping. They are the most playful animals in the sea. It was these, these creatures that the Aleuts hunted for their pelts. From the cliff, I could see the canoes, skim canoes, darting here and there over the kelp beds, barely skimming the water, and the long spears flying like arrows. At dark, the hunters brought their cats into Coral Cove, and there, were, there on the beach, the animals were skinned and fleshed. Two men, who also sharpened the spears, did this work, laboring far into the night by the light of seaweed fires. In the morning, the beach would be strewn with carcasses, and the waves red with blood. Many of our tribe went to the cliff each night to count the number killed during the day. They counted the dead, otter, and thought of the beads and other things that each pelt meant. But I never went to the cove. And whenever I saw the hunters with their long spears skimming over the water, I was angry. For these animals were my friends. It was fun to see them playing or sunning themselves among the kelp. It was more fun than the thought of beads to wear around my neck. This I told my father one morning. There are scarcely a dozen left in the beds around Coral Cove, I said. Before the Aleuts came, there were many. 
Many still live in other places around the island, he replied, laughing at my foolishness. When the hunters leave, they will come back. There will be none left, I said. The hunters will kill them all. This morning, they hunt on the south. Next week, they move to another place. The ship is filled with pelts. In another week, the Aleuts will be ready to go. I was sure that my father thought they would leave soon. For two days before he had, two days before, he had sent some of our young men to the beach to build a canoe from a log which had drifted in from the sea. There were no trees on the island, except the small ones stunted by the wind. When a log came ashore, as happened once in a long time, it was always carried to the village and worked on where a chance wave could not wash it away. That the men were sent to hollow out the log in the cove and to sleep beside it during the night meant that they were there to watch the Aleuts, not to give the alarm, or to give the alarm, should Captain Orlov try to sail off without paying us for the otter skins. Everyone was afraid he might. So besides the men in the cove who watched the Aleut ship, others kept watch on the, on the camp. Every hour, someone, sorry, every hour, Someone brought news. Ulape said that the Aleut woman spent a whole afternoon cleaning her skin aprons, which she had not done before while she had been there. Early one morning, Ramo said he had just seen Captain Orlov carefully trimming his beard so that it looked the way it did when he first came. The Aleuts who sharpened the long spears stopped this work and gave all their time to skinning the otter, which were brought in at dusk. We in the village of Galasad knew that Captain Orlov and his hunters were getting ready to leave the island. Would he pay us for the otter he had slain? Or would he try to sneak away in the night? Would our men have to fight for a rightful share? These questions everyone asked while the Aleuts went about their preparation. Everyone except my father, who said nothing, but each night worked on a new spear he was making. So, uh, chapter four. Whoopsie. <laughs> the Aleuts left on a sunless day. So the Aleuts, uh, spoiler alert. So the Aleuts, the Aleuts are leaving now. They got what they came for. They were looking for, whoa, that's messy. Uh, still too cluttered. Here we go. So the Aleuts are there for the otter pelts. The pelt is the skin of the otter. And what, oops, and what they're, um, so the Aleuts are taking the, uh, the otter pelts. And so this is my, this is the, the best I can do because I'm not going to draw more details than that. But the Aleuts capture the otters and then they, they skin them and they leave, they leave the insides on the shore and they take the, the, the skin, the fur back onto the ship. And in addition to, in addition to the, um, sorry, in addition to the Aleuts on the shore, the uh, tribe, the, the people, uh, the uh, groups, sorry, trying to do a lot of things at once. Um, what they're trying to do, what the, I'll just say, what they're trying to do is, um, spy on the Aleuts and spying in the Aleuts um, because they fear the people of the Island of Blue Dolphins. They're afraid that the, uh, the, they're going to leave. So Captain Orlov, who's the, the leader of this expedition to uh, trap otters, catch, catch otters and kill them for the pelts. They're afraid that he can't be trusted and that they'll leave without paying um, the, the people for uh for the otters and, and the right to sail and, and, and hunt there. So chapter, how are we doing on time? Yeah, I think we can do one more. So that the final chapter that we'll listen to today, and again, this weekend, two more, um, part of the reasons I'm doing this, part of the reason I'm doing this today is that uh, two more chapters are, two more chapters are coming out, one tomorrow and one Sunday. So if it's a rainy day and you feel like listening to Island of the Blue Dolphins, the weekend's great. Uh, otherwise, I can, uh, well, blah, blah, blah. All right, so let's see how long chapter four is here. Perfect, seven minutes. Here we go. Out of the north, deep waves rolled down upon the island. 
They broke against the rocks and roared into the caves, sending up white sprays of water. <clears throat> Before night, a storm would certainly strike. Not after, sorry, not long after dawn, the Aleuts took down their skin tents and carried them to the beach. Captain Otter had not paid my father for the otter he had killed. So when the news came that hunters had packed their tents, all of our tribe left the village and hurried toward Coral Cove. The men with their weapons went first, and the women followed. The men took the trail that led to the beach, but the women hid themselves among the brush on the cliff. Ulape and I went together, far out on the ledge where I had hidden before when the hunters first came. The tide was low, and the rocks and the narrow beach were scattered with bundles of otter pelts. Half of the hunters were on the ship. The rest were wading into the water, tossing the pelts into a boat. The elites laughed while they worked, as if they were happy to leave the island. My father was talking to Captain Orla. I could not hear their words because of the noise the hunters made, but from the way my father shook his head, I knew that he was not pleased. He's angry, Lope whispered. Not yet, I said. And he's really angry? He pulls his ear. The men who were working on the canoe had stopped and were watching my father and Captain Orlov. The other men of our tribe stood at the foot of the trail. The bow went off to the ship filled with otter. As it reached the ship, Captain Orlov raised his hand and gave a signal. When the boat came back, it held a black chest with which two of the hunters carried to the beach. Captain Orlov raised the lid and pulled out several necklaces. There was little light in the sky, yet the beads sparkled as he turned them this way and that. Beside me, Ulape drew in her breath in excitement, and I could hear cries of delight from the women hidden in the brush. But the cries suddenly ceased as my father shook his head and turned his back on the chest. The Aleuts stood silent. Our men left their places at the foot of the trail and moved forward a few steps and waited, watching my father. One string of beads for one adult is not our bargain, my father said. One string and one iron spearhead, said Captain Orlov, lifting two fingers. The chest does not hold that much, my father answered. There are more chests on the ship, said the Russian. Then bring them to the shore, my father said. You have 105 bales of otter on the ship. There are 15 here on the cove. You will need three more chests of this size. Captain Orlov said something to his aloot that I could not understand, but its meaning was soon clear. There were many hunters in the cove, and as soon as he spoke, they began to carry the otter pelts to the boat. Beside me, Ulape was scarcely breathing. Do you think that he'll give us the other chests? She whispered. I do not trust him. When he gets the pelts to the ship, he may leave. It is possible. The hunters had to pass my father to reach the boat, and when the first one approached him, he stepped in his path. The rest of the pelts must stay here, he said, facing Captain Orlov, until the chests are brought. The Russian drew himself up, up stiffly and pointed to the clouds that were blowing in toward the island. I load the ship before the storm arrives, he said. Give us the other chests, then I will help you with the canoes, my father replied. Captain Orlov was silent. His gaze moved slowly around the cove. He looked at our men, standing on the ledge of a rock a dozen paces away. He looked upward toward the cliff and back at my father. Then he spoke to his elutes. I do not know what happened first, whether it was my father who raised his hand against the hunter whose path he barred, whether it was this man who stepped forward with a bale of pelts on his back and shoved my father aside. It all happened so quickly. I, that I could not tell one act from the other. But as I jumped to my feet and Ulape screamed and other cries sounded along the cliff, I saw a figure laying on the rocks. It was my father. Blood was on his face. Slowly, he got to his feet. With their spears raised, our men rushed on across the ledge. A puff of white smoke came from the deck of the ship. A loud noise echoed against the cliff. Five of our warriors fell and lay quiet. Ulape screamed again and flung a rock into the cove. It fell harmlessly beside Captain Orlov. 
rock showered into the cove from many places along the cliff, striking several of the hunters. Then our warriors rushed in upon them, and it was hard to tell one from the other. Ulape and I stood on the cliff and watched helplessly, afraid to use the rocks we held lest we injure our own men. The Aleuts had dropped the bales of otter. They drew knives from their belts, and our warriors rushed upon them. The two lines surged back and forth along the beach. Men fell to the sand and rose to fight again. Others fell and did not get up. My father was one of these. For a long time, it seemed that we would win the battle, but Captain Orlov, who had rowed off to the ship when the battle started, returned with more of his eludes. Our warriors were forced backward toward the cliffs. There were few of them, yet they fought at the foot of the trail and would not retreat. The wind began to blow. Suddenly, Captain Orlov and his eludes turned and ran to the boat. Our men did not pursue them. The hunters reached the ship. The red sails went up. The ship moved slowly between the two rocks that guarded the cove. Once more, before it disappeared, a white puff of smoke rose from the deck. As Ulape and I ran along the cliff, a whirring sound like a great bird in flight passed above our heads. A storm struck us as we ran, driving rain into our faces. There were then other women were running beside us, and their cries were louder than the wind. At the bottom of the trail, we came upon our warriors. Many had fought on the beach. Few had left it, and all of these were wounded. My father lay on the beach, and wave, the waves were already washing over him. Looking at his body, I knew he should not have told Captain Orlov his secret name. And back in our village, all the weeping women and sad men agreed that this had so weakened him that he had not lived through the fight with the Aleuts and the dishonest Russians. So the, oopsie, oops, just missed it. Darn. So the uh, the final the final chapter of um, sorry the final page <clears throat> the final page of that chapter has the oof, it's a very powerful but it's um, you know the previous the previous book I we had for read aloud was I um. The wild robot wild robot was not a um, it wasn't happy all the time you know there were some moments of humor some moments of sadness um but definitely so this scene is uh another the artist this illustrator is uh ted lewin this is the father the captain um the cap captain orlov the russian captain plus uh the chief who is her father and these are the uh yeah, the hats, so that the contrast in hats uh, is very interesting to me. So I'll, uh, I'll be sure to share, I'll be sure to share the different uh, illustrations on, uh, I have to decide where to put those, but the, the illustrations, this is her, uh, the narrator and her brother. That's when they first, when they first see uh, the red sailed ship, which are the, the hunters, the Russian hunters, Plus the Aleuts. Again, I think from Alaska, but I'll double check. So uh, read aloud uh, chapters, like I said, coming up this weekend. Um, I have math with some of you. And enjoy your lunch. Uh, remember to double check. Is it math? Yes. Remember to double check the uh, assignment sheet. Uh, I'll try to get a survey up uh, as soon as I can. All right. Aloha, everybody. Au revoir.